This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today, we're joined by my new friend, Tim Durland, who has a great background in education, is a published author, which you can find all his books on Amazon, and he's doing some really cool things. So I was like, I got to have this guy on. Plus, him and I could talk for hours and hours and hours, but don't worry, we kept it short just for you guys so you can listen to it on your drive time and still get a lot out of this episode. So please enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater, joined by a new friend, Tim Durlin, who is the vice president of the Association of Classical Christian Schools. He was also the head of school for over a decade. So I had to have him on because he is an education genius, and I might you know push back a little bit at that, but I would say he's an education genius. He's written a couple books. You can find those on Amazon, and he can talk about those here in a little bit, but he knows education, and so I wanted to have him on because he works with schools every single day, and so he's seen things that schools are struggling with and schools are doing really good at. What better person to have on than somebody who meets and talks with hundreds of schools to come and talk about what are schools going through and how can we use what they're doing or hopefully not fall into some of the traps that some of those schools are falling into. But I want to take any thunder more away from him. So I'll pass it off to Tim to introduce himself. So Tim, welcome to the podcast, sir. Uh, It's great to be on here, Mitchell. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your work with School Success Podcast and just everything you're doing to help schools in so many different ways. And I'm glad to know you. We uh, we connected a while back, uh, a little bit ago, and now get to talk here. So thanks for having me on. This is going to be fun. It's going to be fun, man. And I refresh me. Where are you specifically? The city you are located in? I I live in Daphne, Alabama. So we're about 45 minutes from Pensacola, Florida, and I can be down to the Gulf Shore in under an hour. So it's a beautiful part of America. Been down here for three years, served as head of school for three years, and then stepped into this vice president role at the Association of Classical Christian Schools. As you mentioned, I get to work now with 450 schools around the nation every day with a variety of joys and struggles. And it's just a lot of fun. Before that, I was head of school up in Delaware. And before that, I was coaching college wrestling, of all things, at several different institutions. So it's neat how God works. Man, wrestling. I wrestled one year and it was like 12 years old, I think. My neighbor was like, you should get into wrestling. And I was like, I don't know about this. And I was like very conservative Christian kid growing up. And so I remember the first meet we got to and I put on a singlet and I was like, no, I am not wearing this out there. And I had, they're like, you have to. It was the most awkward thing in the world. Like two guys wrestling with tights on. I was like, whoa, but I was hey, pretty good. It be, you were pretty good? Yeah. I bet you were. I bet you were. Was it fun? It, I actually did enjoy it. I got second at state my first year of doing it. And oh. I lost to a guy that was a way better than I was, but it was, I actually did enjoy it, but I only did it the one year I focused on football and basketball. Was, There's so much to it. It's, it's a lot of fun, but yeah, it's, yeah, you're not thinking a whole lot about what you're wearing once you get in, in that scrap and it's kind of a legalized street fight. So yeah. um, going from that to, to wearing a bow tie and being head of school was a, a fun transition. I got called to that about 18 years ago when my oldest son was born and I just, put myself back in school. I was coaching at Penn State at the time as an assistant coach. And so I jumped back into the classroom to pick up a couple of higher ed degrees and, um, and to be ready to lead schools. And it's just been a blast. It's neat to see what's going on around America with Christian education and how God has used some recent turmoil in the country with COVID and other things to wake up parents to the option of, of Christian education or homeschooling. And it's just a wonderful time to be to be part of Christian education. Well, you obviously are around 450 schools with your association. So I'd love to just kind of just dive in right in. Like, what are you seeing right now? And I'd love to start with, and obviously the listeners kind of know the flow. If we start with challenges and 
I would love to see what are some of the common ones you've seen come up regularly that schools are struggling with, but also how are they combating them or how would you say they should be combating those to kind of get over those challenges? Uh, that's a great question, Mitchell. One of the things in our association is, believe it or not, the challenge of growth, meaning most of the schools right now are growing and they're wanting to maintain unified organizational culture so that shared values, assumptions, and beliefs. So onboarding parents, onboarding students, onboarding staff, the whole onboarding process has been a unique challenge for a lot of schools that had slow, steady growth in the past. And there's been some really intentional efforts with parent coffees, parent orientations, parent book reading with parents, and, uh, and a lot of opportunities in that way. So that's been a neat challenge. Another one has been school boards. Actually, school boards have really seemingly struggled the past couple of years to focus on mission and vision because there's been so much turmoil around the country and so many people want to have a, a voice. I mean, we're dealing with, with students, with parents' finances, their children, their faith, and now their politics because that's really been driven into everything. And so having school boards stay unified, stay calm, and stay focused on the mission has been a challenge for uh, those are a couple that come to mind. I'm sure as we talk, we can yeah. come up with more, but are those some of the ones that you've been hearing? Man, so sort of. The board one has actually not come up, but maybe once. I've, the, the biggest ones, the hot topic ones that, of course, come up is enrollment. So like not having enough. So they're actually trying to get more enrollment. And then the, the hassles of like, how do we pay for the teachers? We need the teachers, but we don't actually have enough to make it work. So they need another more. They have empty seats. So they're trying to fill those. COVID was, of course, one that came up multiple times, but that's died down a lot for conversation-wise. Fundraising was another big of the piece that comes up with people going, they're tired of the cookie dough and popcorn fundraisers that make them $500, $700, you know, and it's not some of those bigger ticket ones that hopefully don't take months and months to plan. And I'll speak as an example. My son goes to a little, little private school and they did a fundraising. My wife was on the committee and planned it for a few months. They did it and they made $3,000 or $4,000 in this fundraiser. And I'm like, yeah, it's great and good and all. But if you add up all the hours that just was spent on this and the push to make that much, we could have done it. I mean, I, we could, everybody could have just got a part-time job and made more money. And sure. Yeah. So finances is always, always a big issue, right? And it's nice to get to the point where at least 95% of your tuition is covering expenses. A lot of schools are pushing hard to get to that 100% of tuition covering the budget. And then the fundraising can go toward capital campaigns or growing and expanding programs or opportunities. So yeah, I agree with you. The fundraising approach is it's better off to have the the parents that are working so hard selling wrapping paper or cookie dough or any of that, just be a word of mouth team and then ask for checks, ask for donations. And so if, if heads of school boards or others, development directors can just be given the freedom to just sell the vision of the school and ask for funds, it's, it, it seems to go much better. And then you have partners, you have lifelong partners and uh, we don't call them donors or any, anything else. They're partners in the mission. And so that's, that's much better than just doing the one-off sales, right? Yeah. Would you suggest with fundraising, when you're talking about people to donate and asking for checks, do you suggest them just asking for checks or going, Hey, we're trying to build this playground. It's $20,000. Would you be one of the people to donate $2,000? Like you said, giving them the vision of here's what we actually want it for. Not just give us money. We need money. Yeah. I, I typically like to have four or five different buckets to allow people to donate toward either technology, financial aid. Cause a lot of times you need a discount for, uh, for single mothers or working families. So technology, special projects like uh, like playground, like you mentioned, or uh, the fine arts. A lot of people like to give to fine arts, financial aid, and then general, general operations and general operations are the best because you have complete freedom to push in where you need to push into. Yeah, so totally agree with that. And I'd love to talk about the board. You mentioned that. So how, what are some strategies of school, like some easy, simple ones, maybe they haven't thought of to, for assembling a board. Cause I know there's a lot of times there's disruption in the board. There's, there's kind of fighting or not people bought into the vision on the board is if that's happening with a school, is it as simple as like, you know what, we're starting all over, we're firing everybody and we're starting over. Is that the best way to do it? Or how do you kind of seek out those people to be on the board? Should they be all within the school 
or should you look for people outside of the school that have kind of no skin in the game in a way to come in and be a business person that's on the board? Like what are kind of your strategies for that? Uh, I'm a fan of not having term limits on the board. And that's usually a surprising thing to folks because they're used to maybe having a three year time on the board. But think if you did term limits for great teachers or term limits for heads of school. If you have a great teacher or great head of school and then the term limit comes up and you lose them, you have to start searching for somebody else, onboarding them, training them. So if there's a bad board member, they need to be removed, whether they have a term limit or not. And so having, I'm a fan of not having term limits. I'm a fan of, of a sabbatical when needed if someone's been serving for six, seven, 10 years and taking a one, one year off of the board. But having, so having that is good. And then also having a self-perpetuating board where the board replaces itself. So not having the community vote on board members who maybe want to fix a playground or get a certain teacher fired or whatever pl platforms people can run on to get on a board so that you can have good unity, learn to work together. And I don't necessarily think that a board has to fill certain roles. Some boards like to say, we need to have a lawyer. We need to have a finance person. We need to have a curriculum person. We need to have, I think it's good to have mission and vision focused people who realize they only have one employee and that's the head of school or headmaster. And then that employee, that takes care of the rest of the employee of the, and the day-to-day -day operations. So the board doesn't have any living constituents, meaning they don't represent any one individual in the school. They represent a hundred years from now, the grandkids that are coming to the school. So they need to be looking out and have one employee hire and fire the board, evaluate, I mean, hire and fire the headmaster, evaluate the headmaster. They need to be making sure the finances are squared away. So looking at the financial statements quarterly in a deep way, and then making sure that the mission is funded. So they should be involved in fundraising and being out, speaking to the community, bringing in members, donating uh, checks to themselves, something significant. So for, for me and you, maybe something significant is $1,000 if I'm a board member. For other people, something significant for them might be a hundred thousand. So something that that is significant for them personally, they should be giving to the school. But robust training, board governance training, the board should be seeking ongoing training and annual retreats all the time. There's folks like the Champion Group and all kinds of folks that do board governance training. We're pushing into that with the the ACCS because it's vital. The board the schools don't fail. Boards, because the board holds the mission of the school and needs to safeguard that. So, how many people do you think should be on a board for a school? Seven is sometimes a typical number, five to nine. If you get lower than five, it gets tough. If you get more than nine, oof, that's hard to wrangle sometimes. And a lot of times, healthy boards, they're only meeting quarterly because the daily operations is well cared for by the CEO, by the head of school, the headmaster. But again, they're, they're, they're keeping that person accountable, but they're not trying to get into the day-to-day -day operations. Okay. Now you mentioned the earlier, so we're talking about 90, you said 95% of the operating income should be covered by the, you know, the tuition that's coming in. What I think, a lot, do you see a lot of schools kind of messing, getting that messed up, I guess, where they go, man, we're, we really need to run these fundraisers or we need to pay our teachers less because we can't afford to pay them more. Like, are they just, is it the simple solution? Do most schools just need to raise their tuition a hundred bucks a month and boom, all their problems are solved. There's it more than that. And why isn't that happening? I would love to kind of dive into the financial side of where schools are kind of missing the point. I think it's a lot of little tweaks. So maybe increase tuition a little bit, but that's not always the go-to place. So if you increase tuition a little bit, if you have strict internal controls, sometimes schools can run for a couple decades and not realize that their internal controls, financial internal controls aren't strong enough and money is being spent in um, without enough oversight. So it's being spent on good things, but maybe not spent in the best way. And so just tight internal controls that will cut down on excess spending and then being really mindful of tuition projection a year to five years out of kind of where you're going so that you can pay teachers and monitor the budget. And then there's been a couple of times I've gone into schools and the first thing we had to do was approve every dollar spent. Uh, and if you do that for about a year, it really tightens things up. People think about money before they spend it. 
and it sometimes it can improve the budget by 10 percent or more it's wow. really surprising really surprising how that can happen so love it love it and other class size class size if some sometimes a board limits uh, enrollment to 16 students per class and if it's a financial tough place and you roll into maybe 18 students per class or 20 so that you can you need to bring in more and more income and then cut back to 16 again but there's there's ways to tweak and just as long as you it's focused on the vision everything is filtered through the mission and vision to advance the mission and vision and financial strength is huge it's huge if we're not financially strong we're going to be tempted to make bad decisions tempted to let in families that aren't a mission fit and that and tempted to retain teachers just because we can get a weaker teacher for less pay and and it just all just it hurts and and that sounds crass but those are the real struggles and temptations that we go through as head of school to try and um, provide this education that is quote unquote free for the government uh, students. So. Man, well, it sounds like then if the school's listening and they don't have, which I totally agree with this, a mission vision of anything like they've really settled on, sat on, like that needs to kind of be their, would you say their first kind of focus? Like you've got to have everybody bought into this vision. Would you kind of agree they need to have that set in place if they don't? Yes, absolutely. hundred percent. And take a year or more to onboard board members. Just really like take time to onboard them. Maybe have them sit in for six months or more as a non-voting member, just to get the ethos of what the board is all about so that it doesn't jerk radically one direction or another, just with new board members coming on or going off. Love it. Love it. Well, let transition into like the, what's going really good. You've seen schools that are probably, there's a lot of, they're thriving and doing cool things. Anything that stands out to you, they're like, man, I haven't seen many schools do this and I love what they're doing and it's working really well. Anyone's to share? I'm, I'm seeing some schools implement a house system for upper school students. And that's based on a British house system for better or worse. Harry Potter made it popular with the house system, right? But it was long before him. And for those of you who don't read Harry Potter, forgive the example, but it came from Wales and England. The idea of boarding schools where students we would be put into a house. And so it makes a large school smaller when you have representation of seventh through 12th grade all in one little group of 30 students. And then they do activities together. They, they do spiritual formation and devotions together, service projects together. And so the older students, 11th and 12th, are mentoring the 7th and 8th, enculturating in them into the way that we do things at XYZ Christian School. And this is how, how we live and, and grow together. And so there's mentoring, there's uh, growing together. And then instead of moving together by a class or a grade, you get to a cross section of students influencing each other and you can live out the faith as a Christian community and all the different parts of the body. And it can be a really neat thing. So that's one thing I've thought is neat. Some cultural trips overseas to Greece or Rome are typical in our schools so they can then see the birth of Western civilization and stand on Mars Hill where Paul delivered the, um, famous speech about the unknown God right there by the Acropolis and just there's so much going on with doubling down on commitment to God's word. There's the America is less and less Christian. We're in a post-Christian society right now. And so it's caused a really, really wonderful doubling down of commitment to the Christian faith at a lot of schools and uh, the growing of students in their Christian faith. It's been really fun to see. That's awesome. I love the idea of putting them together in a house formation and kind of giving it, and the older leading the youngers, I think there's going to be tremendous value that comes from that. And the, the, hopefully the older kids, of course, are mature enough to lead in a good way and for a good example, which I'm assuming you guys are keeping that in place. Is that something that you only see a few schools doing though so far? In our movement, uh, we're seeing, boy, I'd say 65, 70% of the schools have it. And it's really, it's really growing and helping the culture of the school and allowing students to step up and be leaders and grow and take on responsibility instead of just the teachers doing everything and for them. And it's been neat. It's been fun. And think about the fruit of the spirit you can develop with all that interaction, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long suffering, self-control. There's all of that going on and it can be really neat. That's awesome. All right. So that anybody listening, I think that'd be a cool one to add. Even if you're, you might be like, that's ridiculous. I don't know how I can incorporate that. That I think you guys are going to see value from that for just for years and generations to come. Cause I do see there's tons of value. Like 
my wife and I love the Montessori style of education and like the older, like the, the class my son's in right now, he's the younger of the group. He's three and they're six year olds in that class. And so like, we'll go and observe the classroom, which I love that they have observation rooms. We can go in, nobody knows we're in there and watch. And it's like crazy. Look at these six year olds are huge, you know, compared to like little <laughs> three year olds. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. But they said, I actually have his parent teacher conference today. And the, one of the, they have all these things marked and saying like how he does with the older kids and younger kids and stuff. So it's just cool to see like he's learning. They said he's learning from the older ones. They love to help teach. And then when he gets older, he'll be doing the same thing, helping the younger. I just think that that concept is very good. And I, I think it's, uh, it's going to work wonders. And as he gets older and wanting to help others, because of course I want him to do that as my child. So I love that. I, I love that. Any, any others that kind of come to mind that you can think of, it's like, you're like, 450 schools or some cool stuff I'm sure people are doing. Well, of course, of course, at our schools, we require some unique things. They, they're required to take logic in seventh and eighth grade. And so they take formal and informal logic that helps them with their scientific labs and, and mathematical understanding. It also helps them with their critical thinking and seeing through some newscasters who are always saying logical fallacies and just helps them with their writing. And then when they have to do, um, their rhetoric presentation and their their final thesis, they sit before a panel of judges and it's very much like the dissertation that I went through. And all of these students have to do it their senior year. And it just forces them to learn to communicate because that's the number one soft skill that we're seeing in the workforce that, that people don't always know how to communicate well. And if you can communicate as an engineer, as a scientist, as a, a pastor, anybody, if you, if you can communicate, you're going to be able to have a great effect for Christ and his kingdom and maybe get promotions and opportunities to touch more lives. But back to that house system, how many times in life are we actually only going to be around our age group? Not many, yeah. you, you know, and so it's that whole opportunity to, to learn to live in this world. We try and promote life prep schools, not just college prep schools. College is only one thing that you do on your road to life. So. Yeah. I remember helping out at a vacation Bible school years ago at my church and they, uh, they used the, that format of, they had a first grader, second grader, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to like fifth grade in this, on these little pods that would travel <laughs> around and do the activities. And when I first came in, I go, why would you do that? That's really silly. And then the teacher was like, watch, just watch them because the older will naturally want to help the younger. The younger will naturally look to the older of how to look and behave and want to lead. And, and it was the most calm VBS I've ever helped to volunteer at and be at because that is exactly what happened. And it kind of just shocked me. And that was when I was a, I mean, I was a volunteer, but I was still in school then. I was like 17, 16 or whatever. And that was wow. that first, my first view of that. And then I kind of, when they said that exactly, they said, if look at a group of third graders, they're around all third graders. What are they going to act like? They're going to act like third graders because that's all they see all day long. And so I, it's when yeah, I was open to that mindset. So when like we learned about Montessori and how they structure it, learning about what you're just sharing there, I'm like, it's a no brainer almost in my head of like, yeah, let's be around older, other age groups. And me, my whole life, I don't know where this came from. I mean, I was homeschooled my whole life, but I've always gotten along with people older than me. I would do the rounds at church to say hi to people in the morning and be like 60, 70 year olds. I'd be like, Hey, Hey, hey. I just loved older people. I don't know where that came from, but I, uh, I don't know. I I think that's a beautiful thing about home education. The homeschooling movement has so many great things going on. And that was another thing that's been taken off and it's in a robust way and hybrid models, two days at a quote unquote traditional school and then three days at home are really, it's neat to see what's being done in that way. And then kids can push into the vocational arts or some apprenticeships. And uh, yeah, it's neat to see, it's neat to see everything is go that's going on. Anytime I interviewed folks who were debating whether or not to homeschool or to join our school, I always said, if you can homeschool, do it. That's an amazing, ju it's just amazing. If you can do that well, we don't read about schools in the Bible. We read about parents raising their kids. And so a school is just a tool that a parent should use as they raise their kids. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot here too. So those that are listening, I mean, because we should probably even should have said this at the beginning, they're like classical Christian schools. You know, I've heard of Christian schools. I've heard of Montessori schools and just regular private schools. What is this classical Christian? So if you were to give somebody the elevator pitch of 60 seconds, 30 seconds of what is classical education, what would you say to them? A classical Christian education is passing on a way of life. 
were passing on the Christian faith, we're passing on the Western tradition of society. So we intentionally go back a couple thousand years and read the greatest minds that ever existed. So we read Plato, we read Aristotle, we read St. Augustine, we read Aquinas, all of these original thinkers. We read Dante, we read Euclid for geometry, who came up with this whole method a couple thousand years ago for geometry. We read original source documents so that we can engage in the great conversation that's gone on for thousands of years. We need to know how we got here in America. That we didn't just pop out of nowhere. We've, we've followed this stream of life for thousands of years. And so knowing that, knowing where we came from is important and teaching kids how to think, not just what to think. That's why we require Latin because 50% of our English words come from Latin. That's why we require logic be, for reasons I said earlier. That's why we require rhetoric. That's why we require phonics to learn how to read. Once a student can master how to read, they can learn for the rest of their life. So that's the, that's the short elevator pitch. I guess I took us all the way up to the 14th floor. So <laughs> I think we've got a couple of floors to go. So here, I'm going to, I've never done this before. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Uh, Love it. For a little bit. So if I'm at your, you know, I'm on the elevator ride and I have a student, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm intrigued. So if I go, well, Tim, like just because it's old doesn't mean we should still use it today. I go, well, why would I educate my, my student from all these years ago? Why is that applicable today? I feel like we can function as a society as we have without it. So why would I, why do I need that? So I agree. We don't want to just stand around the gymnastic, the gymnasium like Plato did. We have to do it in, in a modern society. So I don't want to rely on Google. I don't want to rely on Wikipedia education. So we're offering a liberal arts education. The liberal is to liberate from ignorance. And so we're training in wisdom so that they're liberated from ignorance and able to conquer anything that God puts before them. So no, old doesn't mean it's good, but there's a lot of evidence that some of the most brilliant minds received this type of education. Our founding fathers received this type of education and wrote a constitution that's lived for over 200 years. The average constitution of countries in the world is 17 years. Hmm. Every 17 years, they're changing, but but uh, ours has stood the test of time because they thought about they thought about virtue formation. They thought about the eudaimonia and the good life and what it takes to to integrate. They read a lot of Plato to think through the Republic. What does it take to run a great society? Now, look, I'm sounding very patriotic here, but I'm this is great education that didn't just pop up in America. It was going on long before that, and it just happened to spill over and help to develop a, a pretty great country. Now, continuing with my my devil's advocate, yeah, well, Tim, were you raised as a class in classical Christian education yourself? No, I'm a placeholder for those that are coming up and going to really take this thing where it needs to go. So, okay. nope, I was taught at a Christian school through fifth grade, and then a local public school through twelfth grade, and then I've homeschooled my four children, and then had them all in classical Christian education. Four kids, so we've been going through that for uh, sixteen years now. So. Wow. Very good. I see. I love homeschooling. It's good. Do you feel like now seeing what your kids, your own kids have, have learned and seen, do you feel like you look back and go, man, I could have been, I could be a better person now with reason and with stuff like. Oh, 100%. Uh, Mitchell, I, that was the beautiful thing about being a headmaster. I was able to learn things that I should have learned in school that I wasn't taught. I was just given snippets of books or worksheets and I didn't read these great works. And so I've been able to do that more and more lately. And quite frankly, a lot of times I'll ask my kids about some information because they've received this education that I didn't. And so I'm coming up on 50, but my kids are still all in classical Christian schools and they're getting this great education. And a lot of parents, so many parents say that over and over. It's make, it makes them better parents. They become better individuals. And so it's kind of like the Yankees, right? It's hard to understand how great they are until you get inside the organization. It's hard to explain it from the outside, look, understand it from the outside looking in, but from the inside looking out, you understand it and want to invite everyone to the party. <laughs> well, you handled all of them perfectly. So go, let us put <laughs> you under the fire for a little bit. As we wrap up, last question I love to ask everybody is if, you know, we have all these school leaders listening. What would be a piece of advice that you'd want to leave with them? Of course, you have tons of background in education. So kind of what would you want to share with all of them? Two feet 
planted on uh, God's word. So do, are most of your listeners Christian schools or is it a wide variety? A wide variety. So the Christian schools um, stay grounded on God's word. Just dive deeply into God's word, read God's word. Those of you who aren't in Christian schools, hurry up and join a Christian school and start leading a Christian school. And that's what I believe, brother. So yeah, stay close to the board and the board chairman. Work together in unity. Strive for unity and peace, even in turbulent times. Keep things slow down sometimes instead of just reacting. And uh, there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. So stay close to your leadership team. Stay close to your board and stay close to God. Amen. I love it. Well, Tim. Thank you for giving up your time today to hop on the podcast. I love what you're doing. I love that you've shifted and you're now in this association to help lead these 450 schools. So just keep doing what you're doing, man. I love it. I appreciate it so much. If, if anyone wants to learn more about me or connect with me, they can go to timdernland.com. Love to interact with people and just, it's fun to talk with people, fun to talk to you. And I'm just impressed by what you're doing. I called some friends after I met you a month or so ago and just said, this guy Mitchell is amazing. He is just crushing it. He's got all these ideas. He's helping schools. And so I hope that folks continue to contact you and partner up with you to keep their schools strong and healthy. Man, I appreciate that so much. Those that are listening, go buy his book. He's got a couple of them on Amazon, right? Just two, it's two or how many you got? There, there's a few now. So. <laughs> so go buy them. Tim, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thanks. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Tim for taking time and being on the podcast today. I love what they're doing over at the Association of Classical Christian Schools, and I'm just wishing them nothing but the best as they continue to serve all those that are a part of the association and help any schools I know that they come in contact with that they can help. They're doing some really cool things. I'm just wishing them nothing but the best. And if you guys are listening to this podcast and maybe you're not a classical Christian school, I know that you can still get a ton from this episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. And that is the goal of this podcast. I'm wanting you in your school to grow and get better and serve your students better, serve your families better. There's so much to learn out there, and I'm hoping we can give you little bits every single week that you guys can use to make your school better. That's what we're here for. And if you're trying to grow your school and find ways to automate your application process or get more leads for your school, fill those empty seats so your school can make more revenue, so you can provide more salary for your teachers, more resources for your students and all of that, we would love to talk to you because we can help you do just that. You can check us out online, schoolsuccessmakers.com. That's schoolsuccessmakers.com. Or maybe you're more of a Facebook user. That's fine too. Check out our private Facebook group, of course, on Facebook called School Success Makers. That's School Success Makers, private group on Facebook just for school leaders. I'm personally in there and I'd love to see you in there as well. We'll be here next week with another amazing guest as usual on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.